I love uh, mechanics liens. I'm being facetious, of course, but it just goes to prove I'm a very sick individual. I've always found them very interesting because I was a history major. Mechanics liens have been around for hundreds of years in the United States. Here's a trivia, and I was a history major, and I'm in the construction business, and so the, and I like to teach. Um, the first mechanics lien statute in the country was written by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. That's a true story. So you tell me what state had the first mechanics lien statute in the country. Wrong! You all fell for it. The, um, it was Maryland. Because James Madison and Thomas Jefferson wrote the statute, and Virginia passed it soon after Maryland did, but uh, Maryland and Virginia had this joint venture going that they were going to call the District of Columbia for the nation's capital. And it was just a swamp, and we, we need to get roads built, we need to get houses built, we need to build a city here, and so we got to promote risk. It's just like the limited liability entities we were talking about. It's, it's public policy. That that's going to promote development if all of the people supplying labor and materials to build this city are have some assurance of payment, it's going to promote the development. And that was the original idea of the original mechanics lien statute. It was written by uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, but they traveled to Annapolis to convince the Maryland legislature to pass it, and then soon after that, Virginia passed it. Another reason that's relevant, all mechanics lien statutes at one time, like 100 years ago or more, uh, were Id almost identical. Like today, even today, West Virginia's mechanics lien statute is very similar to Virginia's. I mean, I'm not licensed in West Virginia, but I kind of know what it says because I mean, it used to be one state, for Christ's sakes, and so the two legislatures have been toying with it a little bit since then, but it, it used to be identical. One of the biggest examples of that, jumping ahead, um, you'll know later what this means. I'm not going to explain this right now, but most mechanics lien statutes in the country have a defense of payment. That's a big issue. The... Um, Another way of putting the same thing is that um, if, if you don't have a defensive payment, you're a double jeopardy state. The, the, you can make the owner pay twice for the same materials. That's one thing that really varies from state to state. Virginia has a defense of payment. The owner, owner only has to pay once. Maryland does not. You can make the owner pay twice. And... Um, I think it's, it's interesting because it's a, it's a very important difference when you cross state lines. Uh, I also bring that up because it exemplifies the reality that true mechanics lien litigation is a battle between innocents. Uh, you have to remember that. I have clients asking me all the time, why do you lawyers make this so complicated? This is simple. I supplied labor and materials. I didn't get paid. This is simple. It's not fair. Uh, why do you have all these technical rules about exactly how you got to file this mechanics lien? It's, it's because you're trying to make the, the bank that foreclosed on the property, and they lost hundreds of thousands of dollars on that default, you're, you're trying, on top of that, you're trying to make them pay for the brickwork you did in addition to the money they've already lost it's a battle between innocents. And you're never going to get into protracted mechanics lien litigation unless it is a battle between innocents. A lot of the liens I file are glorified demand letters. The, the liens at the beginning, they look the same. Uh, they look exactly the same. And we just mail them, you know, record them and mail them off. 90% of the time, the check arrives in the mail. The phone rings, you know, somebody wants to make a deal. Then you're going to get the one that's going to go on for two years. I've had mechanics lien cases go to the Supreme Court of Virginia more than once. Two years you're talking about. You know, a lot of money. Um, and it was worth it in each case. We had to do it. That's not going to happen. In, there was another innocent party involved, a, a property purchaser in the case I'm thinking of. Um, the other big... 
I, I, I digressed a little bit. Um, the, one of the biggest toyings or changes in mechanics lien statutes in the country was in Maryland. Maryland and Virginia's uh, used to be identical with this high priority that would survive a bankruptcy, that would survive a sale of the property. Maryland uh, amended their mechanics lien statute dramatically around 1976. Because of a constitutional challenge, uh, some, somebody challenged the statute and said this is a taking without due process, that, that this contractor can just go file a mechanics lien and screw up title to my property and they don't have to prove anything. I gotta wait six months for him to enforce the lien is the first time I get a day in court. Now I don't agree with that. And the same argument's been brought in Virginia and did not succeed. In fact, it didn't even succeed in Maryland, but it spooked the legislature enough that they amended the statute. And so in Maryland, you don't have a lien. In Virginia, I have a lien from the moment I began supplying labor and materials. That's an extremely powerful thing. Uh, I lose it if I don't file within time, but I am a secured creditor from the first day I'm out there. That's extremely powerful. Uh, Maryland, I, I am an unsecured creditor until I go to a full trial and the court rules in my favor uh, on, that I have a mechanics lien. And that difference, that is a difference in priority, which we're going to get back to in some length, but just to explain to you the significance of priority, because that's a very lawyerish term, but it is really, really important. And it's something that really varies from state to state. That difference in priority, uh, the higher priority in Virginia is why, since you have those lien rights from the day you start work, if the owner sells the property the day after you stop work, your lien rights go. You, you got to name the new owner and the mechanics lien you file, but your lien rights are just as strong as they were yesterday. And you can foreclose on the new owner, right? Which is one of the battles between innocents you can get into. You're, you're trying to make an innocent owner who paid 100 cents on a dollar for their house, you're making them pay for your brickwork. Uh, there's nothing fair about that, uh, but it works because you haven't been paid and you have mechanics lien rights. Um, whereas in Maryland, in the exact same facts, you would lose because the moment that property was sold, it eliminates all mechanics lien rights, and it's because of the difference in priority. Um, okay, so we jumped way ahead, but that's okay. It's going to be a little bit hard to tell you where to look in the book. There is a chapter, we will be able to for bonds, but with liens, more than half the book is mechanics liens, or about half. There is a chapter, General Mechanics Lien Rights and Principles, which is the closest thing to what we're going to cover in the beginning uh, here. It's just kind of, you know, the five greatest hits, just like with the contracts. The, the, uh, the, the 80% of mechanics lien law that's the same everywhere, that's chapter nine. And um, then we're going to talk... I'm going to boil each state down to just a couple uh, pages. That's what we're going to do at the end. And I guess, let me tell you right now, before I forget, go to appendix, I believe it's 35 and 36. Nope, I deleted some. It's 32 and 33. On one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, here's the differences between Virginia, Maryland, DC, and Pennsylvania lien law. And here's your deadlines. And, and really the differences you can pretty much fit on one page. Most of mechanics lien law is the same uh, in, in all states, which is what we're gonna be talking about uh, now. And this one is the same thing for payment bonds. The, uh, which is the last thing we're going to do today. So just in case I forget, you're going to want to go to this Appendix 32 later. So we're going to talk generally, then we may take a break, or in any event, we're going to shift gears and we're going to rip through the four states, and here's the highlights of the four states.
Then we're going to talk about lien and bond waivers, which uh, waivers are, the issues are really the same, whether you're talking mechanics lien rights or bond rights. And then hopefully we'll have an hour left for payment bonds or at least 45 minutes, and that's the last thing we will do. Okay, so what's a mechanics lien? It's one of these. It's just like a mortgage. And, but it's not signed by the property owner, it's given to you by the legislature. Uh, here's your payment bond, it's a guarantee. It's also an unsecured promise to pay. It is not security. A lot of times I ask clients, well, do you have any security? And they say, yeah, I have a personal guarantee. And I'm like, yeah, I know what you mean, you know. But it's not, it's not actually security. What it is is another unsecured promise to pay. The significance is there's a second contract debtor that you have recourse against. A mechanics lien is different. You have security in the real estate. So a lien is a mortgage. It allows you to foreclose. It makes you a secured creditor in bankruptcy. It gives you two avenues for collection, contract rights and security rights. You want to make sure you're the secured creditor and not the credit card guy on every project that you go on. And um, again, I'm sorry to keep repeating myself, but that's the main thing I hope you get out of this. Not, you're not here so you know what to do 70 days after it's too late to do anything about it and you're about to lose your lien rights. I want you to be thinking about this every project you go on. Am I a secured creditor or unsecured on this project? You qualify each project just like you do a customer. You're going to qualify your customer. That's important. You're going to check references. You're going to ask for a financial statement. You're going to go to NACM group meetings. You're going to get credit reports. But So you're going to evaluate that customer. But two things. Even once you've decided to start selling this customer, one thing is you, you got to do that every three, four, years, three, four, five years, companies get sold, presidents come and go, different people are in charge, who's, who's in charge, who owns the company, do I need to update my credit agreement, that's one thing. Uh, but the other thing is each and every project you go on, you got to qualify just like you qualified the customer to start with. It's not, in other words, it's not a deal where you qualify the customer and your job's done forevermore. You need to qualify each project. And that means collecting information on each project. If you have a moment, you don't have to look at it now, but you can look at Appendix 4, Project Information Sheet. Clients call me all the time, and, and this is usually after, you know, the horse is already out of the barn, and they say, well, what do you need to file suit? or to file a mechanics lien, either way. And I say, what's your email address? And I email them a copy of this Appendix 4, and I say, fill that sucker out. Uh, and one re oh, actually, I think it's going to come up right now. There you go. The contract rosters, if you're looking at it on Appendix 4, who does your customer have a contract with? What's the owner's name and address? What's the general contractor's name and address? What's the general location of the property? What's street address, you know? A copy of the site plan. It depends on what kind of business you're in. You're gonna have different things, but you, you want something, some kind of description of the property. Copy of the building permit is a huge plus because the permit, building permit lists the owner's name, GC's name, the description of the property, the tax assessment you know, number of the property, that's a, that's a powerful sheet of paper. It's also important because they have it. There's no question your customer has it. Uh, the, the, you wouldn't be doing, and, and you have a very legitimate interest, I think, in saying, well, wait a minute, uh, I, I, can you please confirm to me this is a properly uh, permitted project? Send me a copy of the building permit, would you please? And, and that, you, your job's pretty much done if you get that. Uh, it, t it tells you who the owner is and the description of the property. But my real point is, when your customer is now 
90 days past due on some invoices and the most recent invoices they're now 60 days past due and you know something's wrong and they they were telling you for three months checks in the mail checks in the mail now they're not even answering your phone calls if you call them at that point and say, hey, could you give me a little more information about who's the owner of this project and give me the, the legal description? How's that gonna work out? <laughs> You've got to get this information going in. And a building permit is one of the easiest uh, ways to do that. And you're also gonna be in a position forevermore when you receive that building permit to evaluate uh, whether you're gonna have strong mechanics lien rights. So you can use this Appendix 4 to um, evaluate projects going in, which I'd encourage you to do, but this, the list of stuff at the bottom is actually all after the fact stuff. You know, copies of your invoices, your delivery tickets, et cetera. So when you know, clients call me and say, what do you need? I just email them this and see, so I'm, my clock's turned off. They don't have to pay me while I read this list to them. And a lot of clients just know, I mean, I receive cases I receive, this is the cover sheet. I couldn't be happier. The client just fills it out as best they can and they attach their delivery tickets and their invoices and, you know. And part of the point is, this is stuff you can be doing. I'll tell you something I've never understood. People don't like paying legal fees. Um, uh, I've never understood that, but it's true. Uh, and if you're one of those people who don't like paying legal fees, this is something you can do. You don't need to talk to me about it. Uh, this is gonna take you a week to collect this information. You can be getting ready. But as we'll talk about several times today, uh, if you, and it's one of the things I'm gonna focus on, um, you call me with 48 hours notice to file a lien, that's a bad idea for any number of reasons. And one of the reasons is I'm often gonna need information that it's gonna take you a week to pull together. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, so work on that on your own. All right, mechanics lien agent notices. The general rule, as we'll discuss in a moment, is you gotta file your mechanics lien within 90 days of your last work. There are very few exceptions to that. Whether you're talking mechanics lien rights or payment bond rights, whether you're talking about Virginia, Maryland, D.C., or Pennsylvania, as long as you move within 90 days, you're okay. In some instances, you have a little more time, and that's a good example of what I mean when I say I don't think it's a good idea to focus on the differences. Just remember, 90 days. You're okay everywhere, for 90 days with very few exceptions. Here's exception one, I think it's either three or four exceptions. Some states have pre-notices. California and Florida are good examples. You, you gotta send the owner a notice before you even begin work. The only places that is true in our part of the country is Pennsylvania and Virginia. The Virginia Mechanics Lien Agent Notice um, is residential only. They have a very similar statute in North Carolina, but it applies to commercial and residential projects. If you're in North Carolina, that's an issue. So if, if this is something to worry about only if you do residential work. Your Mechanics Lien Practice or my Mechanics Lien Practice in residential in Virginia or everywhere is limited already because you know you're only owed a couple grand on each building and you're not going to want to pay for a mechanics lien to collect a couple grand so you know you really only have a mechanics or I only have a mechanics lien practice in Virginia for the HVAC guy cuz they're owed 30 grand on any house they're building and that's worth it you know so that's a limiting factor already, but here is another limiting factor. If, if you're on a residential project in Virginia, the owner has the option of putting a mechanics lien agent on the building permit. It's optional, but they always will. 
because the lender will require it. I'm not going to lend you a construction loan unless you have a mechanics lien agent on the permit. It's another reason you want the building permit. It's this simple. If the building permit identifies a mechanics lien agent, you got to send notice to that mechanics lien agent before you begin uh, work. If there uh, is no mechanics lien agent, it's open season. It applies only to residential projects. It does not declare default. You're not saying anybody's in default. You're registering. I am registering that I will be supplying the concrete on this property. Sure. If you have a property that's mixed use, is that uh, Boy, you'd be a good lawyer. Um, I don't know. What do you oh, think? Jersey, that's it. One yeah. Well, here, the best way to answer that, I've never had that case, and I've, the Supreme Court's never had that case, uh, and so I don't think anybody really knows the answer. But I would say this. This is probably the most important thing to say. I think it's this simple. You have the same issue with condominiums. Does, does it even apply to a condominium? I can tell you very matter-of-factly that I don't know. I, I have no idea. There's no way to tell reading the statute. So for me, it's this simple. Get a copy of the building permit. If there's a mechanics lien agent identified, you send notice. If there's no mechanics lien agent, you know you're okay. Um, and I, don't, I think that's the best way to deal with it. Does not apply to subdivision improvements. Surely, you know, pavers. Uh, if you're putting in the street lighting for a whole subdivision, you're putting in the asphalt for the lead-in road, you're putting in the curb and gutter, the mechanics lien agent statute does not apply. And as we'll talk about later, we can jump ahead there. There's a nice statute in, in Maryland and Virginia that if, if you're uh, supplying the paving for a subdivision with 10 lots, you have a lien, one-tenth of your lien is on each lot which makes your allocation simple. Uh, you don't have to figure out exactly how much asphalt you put on each parcel. You just get, if there's 10 lots, one-tenth goes on each lot. And also, you do not have to worry about this mechanics lien agent notice. Uh, does not apply to commercial projects. All right. It, however, the bad news is it doesn't do you any good. Sending this mechanics lien agent notice doesn't do anything for you except retain your mechanics lien rights. If you do not send the notice, you're going to be the credit card guy on this project. You're just deciding to be an unsecured creditor. If you're going to be owed two grand on the project, maybe that's okay. If you're owed five grand on the project, maybe that even ten, maybe that's okay. But you're going to be unsecured. Uh, what I care about is that you're aware of that. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because uh, most of you guys don't even do residential, but this is discussed in some length in the book, the Virginia book, at the beginning of the Virginia book, um, and we're generally going in the same order on these slides and in the book, so it's going to be early. It's a timing, and, and there are forms you can use in the appendix to send the notice, and please give me a call if you have any questions. Ma'am. So, excuse me, we do residential, and you said if there is no mechanics lien agent, then we don't, we don't have to send the notice. Right. Well, you wouldn't know who to send it to. So what if the attempt is made and it's unsuccessful? Is there a mechanics lien agent on the uh, permit. No, I think you would have the burden of actually getting it there. In other words, if the post office screws up, it would be your problem, if that's your question. Um, I ran into that. Oh, I believe it. Um, although I'd, res yeah, uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways to dodge certified mail. That's what I'm thinking. Some people dodge certified mail on purpose and, and it, there wasn't anything you could do about it. Uh, what I would do, and this is jumping ahead to payment bonds a little bit, but um, with any type of notice you're supposed to send, you can't send too many notices. You can't send it too many places. And, and that's the policy I encourage 
for any type of notice, including a mechanics lien agent notice, send it regular mail, fax it, email it, and send it certified. And uh, keep a record, and in fact, uh, the folks from my office can tell you, every time we send a letter out of the office, one of the staff people have the job of sitting down and filling out a form that says, I certify this was regular mailed, it was faxed to this number, it went certified on this day. Uh, and that'll win uh, in court. Now, how's the judge gonna rule on that? Whether that satisfies the statute? You know, you could have an argument, it's hard to say, but, but that's at least one way that you can deal with it. That's especially true with payment bond notices jumping ahead because there's plenty of case law in the uh, federal courts of actual notice being sufficient. The, the Miller Act also says the note, well, it used to say it has to go certified. Now it says certified or third party delivery FedEx is okay. Um, but you, I always recommend fax it, email it, because there's clear case law in the federal system that if there's actual receipt, if they actually receive that notice, it doesn't matter that it didn't go the exact way required. And, and so this certification of mailing I'm talking about that you can do in your own office, uh, it, it will definitely work with payment bond. I've never seen the case on Virginia mechanic, there's never been a case on Virginia mechanics lien agent notice, so we don't know, but I would, I would do it anyway. Okay, in Pennsylvania, there's a relatively recent statute, pre-notice statute. It's only on searchable projects, it's only on bigger projects, so it tends to be all commercial. And I have less objection to this in the sense that, unless it's a pretty big project, you don't have to worry about it. Part of the problem with the Virginia statute is it just adds this expense to every project. And when you have, I mean, we represent a lot of stone suppliers and that kind of stuff and concrete. And you know, they're only gonna be owed a thousand bucks on each lot, and they're not gonna do this for each lot. But if you're owed a million in, you know, if it's a million and a half dollar project or bigger, that's a bigger project. And so in a way, it's not as much of a problem that you gotta need to do this. The other thing that's good about Pennsylvania's is they got this website, because getting the building permit, it's your problem to get the building permit in Virginia. And, and it was really an unfunded mandate for any of you guys that are interested in governmental law. But the, the Virginia legislator passed this law requiring you to send these mechanics lien agent. And what it meant is that every county has at least one, if not three, full-time staff people that all they do is answer the phone and tell you whether there's a mechanics lien agent on the building permit. You know, and that's really expensive for the county. It's just an unfunded mandate that the General Assembly passed down. But most of the counties do have, if you just call the building department and say, I'm calling, I need to know, is there a building permit? Uh, they have people, they're used to that. Um, what's even better is to ask people to send it to you. When your customer says, okay, I'm ready for delivery, you say, okay, I'm ready for you to give me, send me a copy of the building permit, because they have it. They have it. You have a legitimate interest in finding out whether or not there's a, this is a legally permitted project. Um, and you can even explain this mechanics lien agent statute and you can explain that you're gonna help them preserve their mechanics lien rights too. You will give them a copy of the notice you're sending and they can plagiarize it and send it themselves uh, is a good way to deal with that. But anyway, uh, Pennsylvania's got this website which is kind of cool and you can just go see if your project has been listed. If it's not list, if the owner didn't list it, you don't have to do anything. If they listed it, you got to send a very similar, uh, if a notice of commencement of the project is filed, you got to send a notice of furnishing within 45 days of your first work, and that goes on the same website. So at least they're kind of high tech about it in Pennsylvania. We'll get into this a little bit more at the end when we do the different states. Okay, but the point is, here's the general rule. 
which I started with. My rule is 90 days after your last new contract work, you need to move. That will be sufficient, whether it's mechanics lien rights or bond rights, whether it's Virginia, Maryland, DC, or Pennsylvania, that's okay with very few exceptions. One exception we just covered are the two pre-lien notice states. Focus on the words new contract. We're gonna come back to that after your last new contract work. In other words, repair and warranty work is more arguable. It may or may not extend your time and it makes a difference what contract you're on. What about demobilization? Well, good question, yeah. Isn't this a great country? <laughs> um, I could get paid thousands of dollars arguing about that and if you want me to, I will. Um, you have the same question with met the inspector for the, for the final inspection. Well, that's pretty necessary. It might even be required of your contract. Does that extend your time to file a lien? I don't know, good question. Um, I wouldn't risk $100,000 on it. Uh, I would count the time from the last day you are, what grants you mechanics lien rights in this 200 year old statute is that you are supplying labor and material that becomes a part of the real estate is English. What the statute says is it's permanently annexed to the freehold, which just proves it's 200 year old statute. What it, when you, your labor and materials supplied become permanently annexed to the freehold, become part of the real estate, now you have a lien, okay? And um, does meeting the inspector for the final inspection, is that labor and materials that are permanently annexed to the freehold? Demobilization, is that labor and materials permanently annexed? I think it's very arguable. I would not risk it. I'd argue that. I think there's plenty of judges dumb enough to rule your mechanics lien's good. But I, to be honest with you, I wouldn't agree with that. Hello. Good question. That's right. They're forms. He supplies, uh, thank you for making us speak up. The, um, he supplies forms that are used for pouring concrete. I think you're okay, but I think there's an argument. I wouldn't be surprised if you got caught in that argument someday. Are you on site? No. Yeah. Simply, I, yeah. Uh, I think you could. Now, if it's pay, this is jumping ahead, but there's no question you have, pay, uh, I don't think there's any question, you have payment bond rights because the wording of the statute's very different. Uh, labor or material supplied for performance of the contract That's what is what the bond statute says. Yes. So your forms are supplied for performance of the contract. That's different than permanently annexed to the freehold. And a, a good example of that, a, this is a place that mechanics lien rights and payment bond rights are very different. I got the client, I represent a lot of precasters, and uh, you know, they take their reinforced concrete pipe out on the site and it's all dumped in what's gonna eventually be the parking lot and it's all stacked up out there. And uh, a client wants to file a mechanics lien and I need to tell them, you don't have lien rights for that pipe stored out on the parking lot. It's not permanently annexed to the freehold. It's not part of the real estate yet. You don't, you know. As a matter of fact, I file those liens all the time because I've learned that by the time we get to court, somebody's probably installed that stuff. But, but I'm t telling you, honest, engine, the correct answer, if, if, if when you get to the court, it's sitting in the parking lot, you do not have mechanics lien rights. Um, but you would have payment bond rights. That's a big difference because it was supplied uh, for performance of the contract. Now, it's still jumping ahead, but while we're on the subject, it does have to be delivered to have payment bond rights. Uh, stored in the warehouse is not good enough. For pay it has to be delivered, but it does not have to be installed. I'm surprised I don't have questions yet. How do you know when you're done with work? I do have a question, sir. The origin of the term mechanic. Oh, oh yeah, good. Well, that's 
that's interesting to uh, crazy people like me, you know, history majors. The, um, the word mechanic, historically, means anybody who builds stuff with tools. And I used to be a brick mason. Well, I'm still a brick mason, but I don't do it for a living anymore. Um, and they, the term mechanic was synonymous with master. People would ask, well, is he a mechanic? they say, yeah, Fullerton, he's a mechanic. Darn right. And the same thing as saying he's a master bricklayer, you know? And that, if you think about it, we've only had automobiles, I guess, close to 100 years, but uh, uh, we haven't had automobiles that long. Really, the real question is, how come the word mechanic came to where it's used only for people who work on machines? It used to mean people that work with tools, people that build stuff. Um, and, or, or, and another example is uh, the mechanics. How, how do the mechanics of that statute work? You know, or how do the mechanics of this system work? Uh, it's a multi-use term. Nowadays, it usually means automobiles. And you do have m mechanics who work on automobiles, do have mechanics lien rights in automobiles. In fact, it is one of the problems I have in my practice. I constantly get calls with people saying, I have a question about mechanics lien rights. And I'm like, okay, great, let's go. I'm all psyched, you know, and they're like, well, we replaced the muffler in this, you know, 10 year old F and the guy didn't pay me. And I'm like, oh my God, um, you know, cause there's only a hundred bucks involved or 300 bucks. And that's not the kind of mechanics liens I do, but you actually have mechanics lien rights uh, for that. Okay, so when's your work done? That's the question I was looking for, ma'am. Yes, and, and I think we, we touched on this in a, some other subject earlier this morning. Your deadlines are running whether the money is due yet or not. Oh, on the form, I was telling you about the change in the Virginia form, the mechanics lien statute, that's one of the newsletters you have. If the change they made is if the money is not due yet, you have to say not due yet and here's when it is due and retention would be an example of that. It might be that that retention didn't due yet because it didn't do until the entire project's complete or it isn't due till it's received from the owner, but your mechanics lien rights are still running. It has no impact on your deadline and you may face the decision whether to file a mechanics lien on when nobody's in default because otherwise you're going to be unsecured and in some instances you must is all I can say. If that's a customer that's going to go bankrupt, the only way you're ever going to get paid is filing that lien and that's why you make the big money because you face decisions like that uh, whether to do, file. Okay, when is your last work. When does the 90 days start? That was the question I was looking for. I liked the light bulb analogy. Let's say you have the electrical subcontract for this building. It's definitely a part of your contract to supply all these light fixtures and install them. And your contract clearly says uh, you're gonna have a working bulb in every fixture, every part of every fixture uh, and that's when you're complete, okay? You come out here one day and you put one light bulb in one fixture, uh, there's no doubt that extends your mechanics lien rights if that bulb was never there before. If you just never installed it and this last day you go out and put that bulb in, there's no question that extends your lien rights. If that bulb was there and it's broken or it didn't work and you come back to repair it, it's a lot more arguable. I can tell you that there's probably a difference between bond rights and mechanics lien rights. The federal bond uh, case law is quite clear. Repair and warranty work does not extend your time to file a bond claim. I would be fearful that a state mechanics lien judge would come to the same decision. There's no 
case law on it I'm aware of in Maryland or Virginia, but I would worry about it. And so that's kind of what I'm doing today is giving you the lowest common denominator, like the 90 days. You're okay everywhere with 90 days, with very few exceptions. You're okay everywhere if you figure repair and warranty doesn't count. You're okay everywhere, but, but maybe it is good enough. And maybe that uh, uh, meeting the inspector is good enough. There's two different questions. What I want you to keep in your head for planning, you know, is the lowest common denominator. But if you're stuck, if, if I don't care whether that light bulb, I don't care if you broke the light bulb yourself, you know, if you go out there and put in a new light bulb, we'll give it a shot. For planning purposes, I would not recommend you count on a $3 light bulb. You count your deadline from when your crew pulled off the job. Sir. So about painting. Yeah. And I finished my job and the crew pulled off and the client calls up and said we need a couple of things touched up. Yeah. Punch, punch list. Yeah. yeah. Well, then you, that does get you into the repair and, argue, uh, repair and warranty debate, Mike. Um, there's no Virginia Supreme Court case law saying it has to be original new work or it doesn't count. There's no case that says that. I would be fearful that uh, a Virginia state judge would come to that decision. So I wouldn't count on it if you can avoid it. But I have no difficulty filing a mechanics lien, and I'm 60, 40, you're probably okay on that. Long periods of time with no work. This is, again, a bond thing. The federal bond law is clear. If you've been off the project 75 days, I don't care if you expect to be back for phase two. I don't care if you're just waiting for the weather to clear up, you know, for a couple of reasons. Number one, the weather may never clear up or the project may be terminated before you go back. How do you know for sure you'll ever be back? And if you never go back, you're not gonna have any more mechanics lien rights. But also, the, the federal bond case law is quite clear that if, if you're off the project for 90 days, you've just lost your bond rights for that older work. You go back on the project, you have bond rights for the new work you're doing, but not for the old work. So anyway, anytime you're off the project, I, I, I say 75 is like outside limit. You've got to be moving fast after 75 days. And it's really more like 60. You need to be thinking seriously. At least start collecting information. You don't necessarily have to call me, but at, start collecting the information. You might look at it. You might decide, eh, we actually have 120 days here, so we're all right. That's good. You're doing your job. That's what I want you to do is just evaluate this stuff. Work performed in order to extend time. There, I'm not aware of any Virginia case law, but there's very clear Maryland state mechanics lien case law that going out on the project in order to extend your lien rights does not work. So let me explain to you what that means. Uh, what that means is you and I will have a conversation when you call me and I will ask you what your last uh, lien rights are, or wh when your last work was. If you tell me in the last 90 days, I'm gonna prepare a mechanics lien for you, I will file it. If you tell me, oh, we went back out on the project last week and delivered another light bulb, um, and so, we, we did that, we have lien rights now, don't we? You know, don't tell me that. Just, just when was your last work? 75 days ago. 90% of the time, you won't be arguing about whether your mechanics lien was valid. The phone will ring, somebody will wanna make a deal. You'll never get to those arguments, most of the time. Uh, I will probably, depending on the situation, I, I may send you a letter saying it's, it's arguable whether, you know, appearing with that inspector extends your lien rights. I can't tell you for sure this lien's valid, but here it is. It sure looks good, doesn't it? 
Um, and you're probably just going to collect your money, and you'll never have to argue about it. Uh, that's, that's the way it works. So that means you need some kind of tickle system. This is particularly directed at the suppliers. Uh, suppliers have an easier time with this. You need some type of mechanical system. You can't make it where it's your job to just kind of know when you're about to run out of mechanics lien rights. You, you have to have some kind of mechanical alarm system. Suppliers have an easier time. The only thing you need to know is it's the last day you delivered material, not the date of your invoice. Very common mistake. I have learned uh, the hard way from years of experience that I I'll ask you, well, what, what was your last deliveries? And you'll say February 15th. And I know to ask the follow-up question, how do you know that? I'm looking at the invoice right here. Is that the invoice date or the delivery date? And you know, a third of the time or more, the response will be, oh yeah, that's the uh, invoice date. What was the delivery date? I don't know, I need to check. Okay, you check and you let me know. And quite often the return phone call will be, well, yeah, it was actually in January. And I have to say, well, you're, you don't have lien rights. Um, the best way to do that if you are a supplier is the date of your invoice is the delivery date. Even if the invoice goes out five days later, the date on that invoice is the delivery date. And then you're looking at a 30, 60, 90 day aging, you know you're looking at 30, 60, 90 from delivery. Now, labor and material contractors have a, a bigger problem. This is a tougher problem for the painters of the world because they're not complete until they get through punch list and everything. Somebody's got to plug in the date. When your crew pulls off the project, somebody, and a good way to do it is, is spend $100 on a QuickBooks program. They're cheap, they're easy to work, and you just create an artificial invoice in that QuickBooks system um, when you pull off the job. And then you can look at a 30, 60, 90 day in aging on these artificial electronic invoices you've correct, uh, created, and you're looking at 30, 60, 90 from the, the last deliveries. That's a good way to do it. Your current accounting program might do it some way or another, but you need some kind of mechanical way to keep track where an alarm's gonna automatically go off when something hits 75 days, somebody has to turn off the alarm. And once you look at the alarm, you might decide, well, this is Maryland, so we actually have 120 days, or we went back and did this punch list, so I think we're okay, reset the clock, uh, but somebody has to be paying attention to it. Now, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but um, last new contract work, you, you each piece of real estate's running a separate deadline. So if you're on a subdivision with multiple lots, that's a big deal. And each contract is running its own deadline, which we're really going to get into in just a moment. Oh, right now. Okay, let's say that um, you got, there's two contracts on this project. You got a plumbing contract and you got an HVAC contract. They're both being performed by the same contractor. That's what the term mechanical contractor means. Um, and a lot of times it is the same company doing the plumbing and the HVAC. One of the last things that happens on a, a project, usually, especially residential, is the HVAC guy goes and sets that outdoor condenser unit. That's usually one of the last things they do because they can do it, you know, at the very end, just go stick it outside. And everybody's using temporary heat. Nobody's using it uh, before that. And, you know, that equipment's expensive and you don't want it out where people are going to hit it with their pickup trucks and their uh, whatever. 
so that's the last thing to happen. So that's the last thing to happen on this project. There's no question that would extend the time to file a mechanics lien on this HVAC contract, but it has does not extend the time to file a lien for the bathroom fixtures you installed four months ago under the plumbing contract. Two separate contracts, each one's running their own deadline. You have to just know that. We're actually not getting that many questions. Usually there would be a hand flying now. What about extra work? What do you think? What does it mean? Well, just to prove I'm a lawyer, I'll say it's complicated. It depends. Well, it's not really complicated, but it depends. Um, there's extra work and there's extra work. If, if uh, one thing I've noticed about excavators, of which I, I have represented several excavators, if, if you get an extra work order from an excavator, usually the, what it says right at the top is this is not a part of any existing contract. This is completely separate from any other contract. And there might be very legitimate business reasons for doing that. Uh, what they really mean is no retention on this extra work. Or what they really mean is the pay if paid clause doesn't count. And, and maybe that makes it worth it. Uh, what, what I care about is that you know that that's, you, now you have three contracts. And each one's running their own deadline. And you have to just know that. However, and this might be what your question's going to be, you could make that extra work a part of this contract. It's what you call a change order. The, the two words, change order, in the construction industry are synonymous with amendment. Any amendment you have to the contract is just called a change order. That's just what we call it in our industry. But if you add an attorney's fee provision, that's by change order. If you change the schedule, that's by change order. If you change the scope of work and the price, that's by change order. That's the most common. Now, there's no question that extends your time to file your lien for your plumbing fixtures because that contract is not complete since that amendment occurred. So, similar to the separate contracts, what, do you, what if you have separate scopes of work within a single contract? If it's a single contract, I think you're okay. I am not aware of any case law on that, but the case law I have seen, and this is just Virginia mechanics lien, this is definitely the law, and uh, Payment bonds, this is definitely the law. Maryland, I couldn't tell you. DC, I couldn't tell you. But the case law I have seen talks in terms of contracts. How many, so if you had multiple phases is a similar situation under one contract, I think you're fine. Uh, the question is how many contracts you have. Okay, so if you think about it, the other possibility is you could have just made this all one contract. You could have just had a mechanical contract, which is in a way is kind of answers your question another way. You could have made this one contract, just made it multiple scopes of work in one contract. And if you did that, uh, now there's no question that setting that HVAC unit on the last day extends your right to file a lien for the plumbing fixtures you installed four months ago. So. I, you're the business people, uh, you're the ones making all the money, uh, you decide how many contracts you want. I don't care about that. What I care about is just that you know it has an impact on your deadlines to file lien or bond claims, and it's a reason you might want to put everything in one contract, or it, you at least want to know that for your tickle system, your tracking system, so you know uh, when you need to move. Okay, you also need a description of the property for a mechanics lien. How many parcels of ground are you talking about? People like Shirley or any excavator or concrete people, this is an issue. Precast concrete people, this is an issue. 
and it's going to take time. You need to be working on this. You know, painters, this isn't usually an issue. I mean, uh, electrical is a better example. I mean, you're all on one lot. Uh, it's simple. But if you're doing uh, over lot grading, you're grading for, for 10 houses in a subdivision, you're on 10 different parcels of real estate. And you're going to need to tell me the exact value of the labor and materials you supplied on each of those 10 lots. Subdivision improve, off-site subdivision improvements like you're putting in the street or you're, you have one-tenth of the lien is on each lot. Overlot grading, that's not a subdivision improvement. You, you worked on each of the 10 lots. You have to tell me the value of the labor and materials you put into each lot. Uh, which is the general rule until they pass this new statute about subdivision improvements. That, that used to be the rule about everything. you you got to know the labor and materials on each lot. Okay, you have a problem with off-site work. Again, the excavator, um, a BMP pond, stormwater retention pond, that could be on the neighbor's parcel. It could be down the street, a different owner. But it, it is a subdivision improvement for this subdivision here, and you have lien rights. But my real point now is I need to know that to do your mechanics lien. I got to know the legal description of the property we're leaning. So I'm going to ask you that. That's, that would be a good reason why I can't do a lien in 48 or 72 hours notice because I'll be, well, you need to get me a copy of the site plan, legal description of wherever this stormwater retention is. And if you can't do that real quick, we're not going to get a lien filed. Uh, you need the amount of the claim for each. Tracing. Well, this is, again, more a material supplier thing, but with paintings the same way. You need tickets of some type created in the ordinary course of business, the number of hours and the number of gallons of paint into each of these uh, 14 lots in this subdivision. That's what you're going to need. And if it's created in the ordinary course, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to tell you it's got to be entirely accurate. Uh, if, if it is created in the ordinary course of business and your people are trained to, and told to accurately record this information, it's going to work. You're going to be okay. You, making it up after the fact is going to be a problem. Um, and plus, I think it's kind of helpful information to have anyway, how long different models of houses take and that sort of thing. Counter sales are an issue. You're, again, this is a material supplier thing. Material suppliers, you want delivery tickets, and, and the ticket's got to show what lot it went to, not just, you know, Greenbrier subdivision. It's Greenbrier subdivision lot 10. And your delivery people got to know that. It's got to be on the ticket. If you're on the ticket, you will win. Uh, I will win. Your mechanics lien will succeed. Uh, if your tickets all have property listed on them, and, and we can say your people are trained to mark the lot number down when they deliver. Uh, counter sales, however, are a problem. Uh, your counter people have to know that and I've seen these, these invoices or these delivery tickets, these counter tickets, they say lot number or prop, you know, delivery address, and it's just like X, X, X. Thanks, bud. You know, you just decided for the company, you just decided for the stockholders that they don't care whether they're a credit card, unsecured creditor, or a secured creditor. It's just not important. Well, the shareholders might think it's important whether, whether they're going to collect this receivable. Uh, counter people uh, have to be under threat of death. Nothing goes out the door unless the customer tells them. If they don't know what lot it's going to, they need to find out and tell you and put it on the ticket. Allocation. This is a true story. Uh, an early case I had in the 1980s. So I had a client call me and they say, well, we delivered a bunch of lumber and we didn't get paid. We want to file a mechanics lien. I said, okay, good. Uh, what's, what's the property description? And they said, well, it was uh, building one. 
at Greenbrier. And I'm like, all right, cool. What's the street address? Okay, here's a street address. So I went and did a title search, which I will always do. Um, it, it is malpractice per se to prepare a mechanics lien and file it without doing a title search. It's, it's the same as buying the property, okay? Maybe if you're owed five grand, we'll just get the description off of tax assessments or we'll just use a street address or something. But if you're owed 100 grand, we ain't gonna do that. We're gonna do a full title search. We're gonna find out the owner's exact name. We're gonna find out the, how many parcels of ground we're talking about. Um, for, and this is a good example. So I ordered a title search. I received that title search and I called my client back and I said, guess what? Building one is actually seven different parcels of real estate. It's what we in the business call townhouses. And they just drop dump the lumber right here. They, they had no idea that was townhouses. To take you to an even more sophisticated realm, this could be a condominium. That's the difference between a condominium and a townhouse. A townhouse, this is the property line. These are seven different parcels of real estate. A condominium, in fact, there might be building one, two, and three are all part of the same condominium. All 21 of those units are on the same parcel of ground, right? It actually makes mechanics liens on a condominium a lot simpler. You don't have to allocate like that. But if, this, if these are townhouses, these, um, are each separate parcels of ground. And I, I used to be a brick mason and we would put these firewalls in between these townhouses. You know, with cinder block, that's when, that's the difference between the 20 year old, uh, 22 year old rough and tough brick masons and the, the 62 year old old men uh, who are laying brick. Uh, you know, we used to lay cinder block all day one handed and uh, like now, I would probably need both hands and it would take me five minutes to get a block up in the wall. But um, we, we used to build these out of cinder block, these party walls. And I never thought about it at the time, but in connection with this case, I did. Because I had to, if you think about it, the block in this wall is only in this lot. The block in this exterior wall is only in this lot. Any exterior wall, the, all of the block is in that lot, but the block in this interior separation wall, half the block's in one lot and half the block's in the other. And you're gonna have to tell me the exact value of every dollar a cinder block in each parcel of ground there. Now that adds to your expense for doing a mechanics lien uh, and it might be enough that you don't want to fool with it. It depends on what you're owed. But what's important to me at this point is that you understand this. This is information you could be collecting in the two weeks before you call me is one reason I bring it up. Um, and if you, the other reason is if you call me with 48 hours notice, I'm going to tell you, go figure this out for me. You're going to make a mistake if you try to do it in just a couple of days. You will make a mistake. And if you force me to prepare a mechanics lien in 48 hours, you're putting me in a position I'm going to make a mistake. It, it's asking for trouble. Subdivision improvements, we kind of talked about this. It, it is easier. It is a blessing. Virginia and Maryland both have very logical statutes. You supply the asphalt on this uh, entrance road for these 10 lots. You, one tenth of your lien goes on each lot. There can be a lot of complications and a lot of arguments that I'm not gonna get into. Off-site work is one. Different phases in the subdivision is a really good example of one of those questions nobody knows the answer to. Um, and, and there's a lot of discussion in the book I'd invite you to look at. Otherwise, give me a call, because it would. I think it's very interesting, but it would take a long time. All right, defense of payment is a big deal. This is one of the big places that there's a big difference between different states. 
Maryland and Virginia to be exact. The defense of payment is that the owner must only pay for the project once. Once the owner has paid in full for the project, they have a defense to any mechanics lien filed. The defense is, I paid. And if they can prove they don't owe any money, any mechanics liens will fail. That defense of payment can come from writing checks. That defense of payment can come from back charges or any type of breach of contract by the contractor that means they're owed less money. And that's a lot of what I do for a living is, is litigate about those kind of defaults and back charges. Uh, I might represent the supplier who there's no question you're completely innocent. You supplied perfectly good forms, but the argument is the GC saying, I terminated that sub because they were bums and I don't owe them any money. And if you think about it, it there can be a lot of money involved you're forced to step into the shoes of your customer and, and they never do anything wrong. They're, they, you know, and, and they may have filed bankruptcy or they may have gone out of business, but, but, and it becomes very important whether those people are going to help us prove they were owed money and the legitimate people will. In fact, that's a good way to find out whether they're legitimate. I've had people just spend a lot of time helping my client collect just you know because they want to do the right thing but also they're just so angry that they were wrongfully terminated or whatever it was so that's that's what you that's what a lot of mechanics lien litigation is and again it's a battle between innocence in the sub in the GC's mind he's innocent he has legitimate back charges in my client's mind uh, he's innocent he supplied perfectly good material the, the intervening sub uh, became insolvent and went out of business. You know, who's, whose fault is that? Maryland has no defense of payment. Okay, here's the payment tiers again, just like the trust fund. 100 grand's owed here, 60 grand's owed there. I file, I represent the stone supplier who is owed $75,000. I perform a title search on the property uh, and I file a mechanics lien for $75,000. If we assume that this is the correct status of accounts upstream, to what extent will that mechanics lien be enforceable? How much money am I going to get? Very good. The first try was correct. Uh, 60 grand. The GC has a defense of payment also. We cannot make the GC pay more than what they're owed. So the GC's got to kick in the 60 to my client. They get to keep the other 40 from the owner, and the case is over with. We all go home. And that happens a lot, too. You know, if, and if, uh, you know, I might file a mechanics lien for you, if, if the owner can send me the contract and show me, here's the dollar amount of the contract and here's all the checks I wrote to them, canceled checks, and so I only owe 60 grand, I'll tell you, take the money and run. This is not worth, you know, they're gonna succeed on this defensive payment and 60 grand's a lot better than nothing. And uh, so that's what you ought to do. Uh, that's, or, you know, a lot of times I'm litigating, I'm arguing with the owner about how much they owe or the GC. That can definitely happen too. All right, what if there's another supplier? Supplier number two is owed 150 grand. Now what happens? First in line, first in line. Ooh, that, another very good guess because that is the rule about recordations generally. When we get to priority, we'll mention, usually it's the order the things are filed in the land records determines the priority. So that's actually uh, good thinking, but it's not actually correct. Mechanics lien law is an exception to that rule. Uh, and it does not matter what order they're filed in, 
all mechanics liens are of equal priority. What matters is that you have a valid mechanics lien. If, if, you, if your lien is invalid for some reason, or even more obviously you never filed a lien, uh, you will have, you have no right to share in that money. But if you filed a valid mechanics lien, it doesn't matter what order they're filed in, you're gonna take pro rata. Of the 60 grand, see I made the math simple, two thirds of the debts here, one third of the debts here, 60 grand divides real easily, one third, two thirds. That's how it gets split up. Now, supplier number two had very poor taste in lawyers. They did not hire a good lawyer. They hired somebody other than my law firm. And their lawyer did not perform a title search, or maybe the client called them with the day the lien was due, and it's impossible to do a title search and file a lien in one day. So they just, you know, lawyer asked them, well, who's the owner? And, oh, John Smith, okay, so we file a mechanics lien says John Smith is the owner, here's the street address. I mean, I'll do the same thing if it's the only thing I can get filed, but I'm gonna give you a letter saying, I have no idea if this is right or not, but we'll file it, we'll see what the heck happens. Some locations don't have an actual address. Like oh yeah, that's a lot of how I make a living. And I find it very interesting because I represent a lot of infrastructure People, precasters, asphalt, concrete, all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you often need to be a licensed surveyor to be able to describe the real estate. And I'm, I'm very comfortable looking at site plans and, and that's what, and I do the title, you know, the client's got to give me the site plans. And that's a very important for you to retain that stuff and be able to show me the picture of right where all this pipe went, you know. Um, but I'll go in the land records and see sometimes you may have no awareness that the land's been subdivided. But if a deed of subdivision was recorded yesterday, your property description just changed. If, if the property was sold yesterday, your ownership just changed. That's what I do for a living. And, and I got to check that right up, what they say, up to the box, right up to when I'm recording your mechanics lien, I got to know that that property description's changing. Um, now, it's getting a little complicated, so I'll leave it at that if you don't mind, but we can discuss it another time if you want. Now. Supplier number two has bad taste in lawyers. They did not do a title search. They filed a mechanics lien identifying John Smith as the owner. I had done a title search because you were smart and you gave me a week or 10 days to get the lien done so I could do a title search. And I saw that the owner was John Smith LLC. And that's the way I filed that mechanics lien, John Smith LLC. And I had a lot block subdivision description and a street address. So we're good, our lien's valid. But I tell you, client, you know, I saw the other guy's lien in the land records and I'm telling you, that's an invalid lien. There's no question that is an invalid, unenforceable lien. And if I point this out to the judge, uh, there's no question the judge is gonna drop kick that mechanics lien out the courthouse door and you'll get the whole 60 grand. Or we can just settle the case now, you get 20, they get 40. What do you want to do? You got a decision to make, client, what do you want to do? You want me to, you want to just take 20 and call it a day or, or, or you want me to tell the judge that other lien's invalid and get the whole 60? It's really not fair that they don't get paid. The debtor told them six times the check was in the mail. They delivered perfectly good material. Why do lawyers make the rules so complicated? Who cares whether there's LLC on the name or not? What difference does that make? 
Why I deserve to get paid, why can't I get paid? It's a, it's a battle between innocents, is what true mechanics lien litigation is. As a matter of fact, it's unusual for lien claimants to nitpick at each other's liens. There's kind of an unwritten rule you don't do that because, you know, those of us who live in glass houses, you know, we don't want any missiles launched at our mechanics liens either. So that's actually kind of unusual. But if enough money is involved and the error is that obvious, uh, <clears throat> uh, you might do it. Okay. Now, I want you to think about it. If nobody filed a mechanics lien in, in this fact scenario, this might be the only asset this excavating sub has. This excavating sub owes hundreds of thousands of dollars all over town for all their equipment. They own, they have a credit line that is a secured creditor. They owe, they owe money to general unsecured creditors all over town. Uh, and they owe money to you. Who gets that money? This, this is the significance of priority, and this is the significance of a mechanics lien. Point one is, if, if nobody filed a lien on that project, the bank would get the money. The bank that has a security interest on all of the accounts receivable of that excavating sub, they're a secured creditor. That's their 60 grand if nobody filed a mechanics lien for sure. You must have a valid mechanics lien, not just file, but it's got to be valid, to claim any part of this receivable. But since you did file a valid mechanics lien, you beat the bank. How powerful is that? That's really something. That's what's special about Virginia mechanics lien law, the priority of that lien. Mechanics lien claimants are adverse to each other is another point, although it's unusual to get arguments. It is a battle between innocents. Okay, this is your true deadline for filing a mechanics lien. If the owner's about to pay, and this is, I can't remember whether this is the second or third, uh, exception to the 90-day rule. If you're in a defense of payment state, like most of them, like DC, like Virginia, if the owner is about to pay the general contractor in full, your mechanics lien rights are about to go out the window. When is the owner going to pay the GC? You don't know. I don't know. Thank God for retention is all I can say. I mean, as a more remote supplier, if you're down the tier, that's really the main thing protecting your lien rights is the fact that owners are so reluctant to pay that last little bit of money, and it's part of why they're so reluctant. They want to know whether there's any claims on this project before they let go of that last money. Another point about defensive payment, the more removed you are from the owner, the more likely you'll have a problem. I mean, there might be sub-subs. The chart we were looking at, there might be owner GC, sub, 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 then there's a supplier. And this is a big factor when you're dealing with disadvantaged business enterprises and stuff. The, the longer that chain is, the more places there could be a break in the chain and you have a problem. <clears throat> if you are, if you're a general contractor, if you're working straight for the builder, it's impossible to have a defensive payment. However much money you might be in breach of contract, you may be in a dispute about how much you're owed, but however much you are owed, you have mechanics lien rights for that dollar amount. Um, and if you're only one, if you're a sub, right, all you got to do is worry about the GC. And most GCs are pretty big. All right, practicalities on freezing money. Because this is your true deadline, it becomes very important to freeze the money as soon as you can. The first thing we will do, you send us a case, you take that appendix four, you fill it out as best you can, you email it to me with copies of your delivery tickets and your invoices. The first thing we're I'm do is order your title search, which is gonna take three days to get. 
uh, and I'm going to send a project demand letter. I'm going to do both those things the same day. A project demand letter goes to the owner, the banks, the GC, anybody, and this is where it becomes very important how many addresses you have. And since you were smart and you collected information before you went on this project, you know all that. You have a copy of the building permit. You know who the owner is. You know who the GC is. And I'm going to address a letter to all of them. First thing I'm going to say is this is a claim on the payment bond for the project. The next thing I'm going to say is um, we're preparing a mechanics lien to file on this project. A notice like that, that is an effective bond claim notice if, if there is a bond. So part of the point is you don't need to know whether there is a bond to make a bond claim notice. Just send the friggin' notice. It, it's going to at least freeze any more money. Uh, and anything you can do to freeze the money increases the chances. Usually the owner or the GC or whoever, they'd rather get the money to you. If they know there's a problem and they have a sub that's in default, they'd rather you get the money than them. And they're at least going to freeze the money and they're going to try to figure things out, you know. It's very important. If, if you did not collect information about who the owner is, and this is for remote people, if you're working right for the owner, you don't have a problem with this. But if you're a remote supplier uh, and you call your customer when they're 75 days in default and say, hey, do you mind telling, giving me the owner's name and address? That ain't going to work out, is it? If you don't have the information already, you're in trouble. All right. So uh, the second part of that letter, I'm working on a mechanics lien, is of no practical effect, uh, excuse me, no legal effect whatsoever. But it tends to freeze money. While we do our title search, while we prepare our actual mechanics lien, it just makes sure everything stays where it is while we spend another week uh, getting our mechanics lien done. Another point, I shouldn't tell you this because I'm working myself out of a job, but if you think about it, you can do that yourself before you call us, especially if you know who the owner is. And uh, well, we have some GCs uh, here, so they can probably answer this question. If, what happens, if you receive a notice from a supplier, an asphalt supplier, saying uh, you're supplying all the asphalt on this project and your customers now 60 days past due and uh, you got to start, they got to start looking at their mechanics lien rights. Are you going to let any money go after that? After you receive a notice like that? The answer is pretty universal. It's all you got to do to freeze the money. Uh, and, and you're really helping yourself a lot. All right, remote subs can be a problem, the payment chain. In Maryland and Virginia, there is no known limit. You can be, it does not matter how far removed you are from the owner. You have lien rights. Maryland and Virginia. What you, you may have a tracing problem, the more removed you are, the harder it's going to be to prove where your labor and materials went, that can be a problem. In Virginia, it also makes it more likely you're going to have a defense of payment problem for the reasons we just talked about, but you have lien rights no matter how far removed you are. D.C. and Pennsylvania, there is a limit. And in fact, in D.C., I mean, the bottom line is suppliers don't have lien rights in D.C. for just this reason. You do not have lien rights in D.C. unless you have a contract with the owner or the G.C. That's as far as it goes. If you're supplying a sub, you are an unsecured creditor. You just got to know that on any D.C. project. Uh, you got to get a joint check agreement, find out if it's bonded. You got to do something different. You're not going to have uh, lien rights. You can get an assignment of lien rights is often a good idea. Get your debtor to assign their lien rights to you. That's something they ought to be willing to do. And then you got to file a lien in their name, but they're giving you the legal right 
to file the lien in their name. All right. Third tier sub, uh, uh, Pennsylvania used to be the same, where you had to have a contract with the owner of the GC. Was it 2007? I forget. I think it was 2007. They amended and it goes one tier lower, which helps. If you're supplying a sub, you do have lien rights in uh, Pennsylvania. Okay, priority is kind of a legal beagle thing. I think this is the last subject, but it's important. That's why I leave it for last, because I hopefully you guys have heard enough now that you know priority is significant. Even though it sounds very legal-ish, I'm not discussing it just because I like talking about complicated stuff. It's actually like important. It makes a big difference. And you need to know as you cross state lines, there is a big difference in the priority of the mechanics lien, and it, it makes a big difference. What we're talking about is a sale of the property. What if the property sold, do you still have lien rights? What if the owner files bankruptcy, do you still have lien rights? And particularly in Virginia, the other thing States really vary on who wins as between the construction lending bank and the uh, mechanics lien claimant. That really varies from state to state. Priority is generally, as we were discussing earlier, the general rule is that priority, it's, it's first in time. Whatever mortgage gets filed first, that is the first priority mortgage. If you look at a second mortgage, it does not say second mortgage on it. it. It's just one's filed five minutes after the first one, that's a second mortgage. The, the, the second one filed has second priority. And who, whatever lender has the first lien, there's a foreclosure, the first lien holder gets paid in full. If there's anything left after the first lien holder is paid, it goes to the second lien holder. That's the way it works. The first and second lien holders will be paid before any general unsecured creditors get anything. So priority can easily determine whether you get anything. Let's say there's a $100,000 townhouse. Mom and dad pay, and you can tell this is a dated slide. You can't even get a townhouse for 100 grand anymore, but let's pretend you could. Uh, they pay 100 grand for it. And I remember when I was a young man uh, that the first house I ever bought, right after that, the phone was ringing every night. I'm trying to eat dinner uh, with my wife and little kids, and it would be some second mortgage lender on the phone telling me that all I had to do was say yes and they'd give me a second mortgage and it would be at a high interest rate and I could borrow 10 grand on a moment's notice in the future. Um, you know, HELOC, home equity line of credit. Well, a conventional lender is only going to uh, lend 80% of the fair market value, that first trust lender. But the second mortgage lender is going to go to 90% or maybe 95 They are secured creditors. They're both perfectly valid liens. They're both secured, but the priority makes a significant difference because if that property goes to foreclosure, $100,000 townhouse, what are they going to get? 85 grand, 90 grand in, in a foreclosure auction? And then the, the first trust lender the trustee's fee, the 5% trustee's fee is paid. The, the taxes are paid. The real estate taxes are paid. And the property only sells for 85 or 90 grand. Guess what? The first trust lender is the only one that gets anything. And they may not be paid in full once they're done paying the trustee's fee and the real estate taxes. Maybe they only get 75 cents on the dollar. Second trust lender gets nothing. Point being, priority matters, you care. The priority of your lien is important. All right, there are certain super priority liens that break the rule about first in time. One of them is tax liens. Tax liens always come first. Uh, the, the, you know, the king rules. The king always gets paid his taxes first before anybody else gets anything. 
Another example is mechanics liens in some states. It comes down to whether the mechanics lien is inchoate, which is a Latin term we lawyers use just to prove we're really smart. In this region, Virginia has the highest priority lien of any of the states, of anywhere I know of in the country for that matter. There may be some that are equivalent. Uh, I would be surprised if any of them are higher priority than Virginia's, but I'd be interested, but I don't know. But around here, it definitely is. A Virginia mechanics lien, you beat everybody except the county gets their taxes and the bank has priority over the land, not the structure, the land uh, for the value of the land at the time of the foreclosure. Now this is oversimplifying it a little bit, but it's a good way to remember it, and it's the way you'll hear a lot of people say it, is in Virginia, the bank has first priority as to the dirt, the mechanic has first priority as to the structure. And again, um, the whole idea is the mechanic is supplying their blood, their guts, their labor, their material in order to enhance the value of this piece of real estate and therefore they should have the first right to that value. That's the idea, which makes perfect sense to me. Um, but I can tell you from representing a few banks, it makes no sense to them whatsoever. D.C. and Pennsylvania are kind of in the middle. They're the same. They are inchoate liens, which we'll get back to. But uh, they are inchoate liens, but the construction lender wins over you in D.C. and Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania. In D.C. and Pennsylvania, a bank can say, well, I'm eventually going to lend a million bucks, and I'm recording a mortgage for a million bucks, uh, and if they do that, they, they win over any mechanics liens. But in Virginia, even though they always do, they file a mortgage saying, well, well we will eventually lend a million bucks. It doesn't matter what the mortgage says. What matters is what's the value of the dirt at the time work commenced, uh, and that's all they have uh, uh, priority to, the bank, and you win otherwise. Maryland is the lowest priority lien that we deal with. It's the same as a judgment lien. You have no lien until you go to a full trial, the court hits their gavel on the table and says, you win. And in fact, just like a judgment, and this is true of a judgment in Virginia too, a judgment anywhere, and a mechanics lien in Maryland, if the property owner files bankruptcy within 90 days after your judgment, you're on your mechanics lien, uh, your mechanics lien is a preference and it is removed and you are a general unsecured creditor. So in Maryland, uh, if the property is sold at any time before you get to court, your lien rights just went out the window. If the owner files bankruptcy at any time less than 90 days after you get your judgment, you lose. So that, that lower priority is very significant in Maryland in the case of a sale of the property or a bankruptcy. Uh, on the upside, there is no defense of payment to a mechanics lien in Maryland. You can make the owner pay twice. So as long as there's no bankruptcy or sale of the property, the Maryland mechanics lien is, is more better. Okay, Virginia, D.C., and Pennsylvania have inchoate liens. From a history student's point of view, uh, I can tell you the reason is all liens were inchoate at one time. The original statute drafted by Madison and Jefferson, you know, for hundreds of years, most liens are inchoate. Maryland changed their statute in 1976. That's the, only, that's the reason it has a lower priority. That was a purposeful 
action by the uh, Maryland General Assembly. So what's that mean, inchoate? I don't usually like to use Latin terms, but you have to. It, it, there's no English translation, really. What it means, the closest thing to a translation is multiple words that it relates back to the commencement of work. It is as if you filed your mechanics lien the day work began on that project. And, and the anybody who files something in the land records after work commenced are, is subject to your lien. OK, the lien relates back in time. That's a timeline right there. It is. Here's where work starts. Here's your last work. What we've already talked about is you have to file your lien within 90 days of your last work, which is oversimplifying it a little bit. We'll get to the exact deadline in a few minutes. You got to file your lien within 90 days. What happens if the property sold right here? That's what we're talking about. Uh, well, if the property sold right there, it don't matter. Your lien relates back to the commencement of work. And so anything that happens after commencement of work, your lien rights are superior to that. And you win over the purchaser. You darn sure better do a title search. You know, you need to know the owner changed. You got to correctly identify the owner in your mechanics lien. And I literally, I mean, it's why I pay high malpractice premiums. I have to be, I go and record a mechanics lien for you. I got to be looking at what is recorded 30 seconds before I record your mechanics lien. If, the, if this property has been sold, I have to know it. Uh, and if I don't see it, I just filed an invalid mechanics lien for $2.6 million or whatever it is. And that can be a problem. What if bankruptcy is filed? Same thing. If the bankruptcy trustee takes subject to the mechanics lien rights, you win over the bankruptcy trustee. You have the first right to that $60,000 receivable flowing down. The owner may have a defense of payment. The GC may have a defense of payment that limits it to 60 grand, but you, you win over the bank that has a security interest on the accounts receivable. You win over the bankruptcy trustee. Uh, which is the same thing as saying you win over general unsecured creditors if, if you have. And it's why it's a preference uh, defense. If, if you get paid right here and the trustee sues you for a preference two years later, my defense for you is, look, right here, I still had five days to file a mechanics lien. And if you hadn't given me that check, I would have filed a mechanics lien. And if I had filed a mechanics lien, I would win over the bankruptcy trustee. Therefore, I was not preferred by the fact that you paid me right, you know, right before you filed bankruptcy. All right. Yeah, I don't even need relief from the state to file a mechanics lien. As a matter of fact, if your debtor files bankruptcy, I'm going to be in court within a week filing your mechanics lien. We do not have to go to bankruptcy court and get permission to do that. You have an absolute right because you are not preferring, you are not advancing your legal position. You had the lien since work commenced on the project. All you're doing is giving notice, giving public notice of the lien that you always had. All right, if the lien, okay, we really did this already, so we'll go through it. So if, if it's not in Kuwait, sale the property destroys lien rights, bankruptcy will destroy lien rights. Uh, that's Maryland. 